Hello and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am at a slightly different angle than usual. This is because I am doing sort of the the prequel to an unhaul video. I have been reading a lot, especially over the past two years in terms of my life timeline, and so it means that my bookshelves have been filled rather quickly. I've been able to generally make enough space for incoming books as outcoming books, but I have now hit the snag in the road. Here is <laughs> the pile of unshelved books as they currently stand. They need a home. I need to find space for them on my shelves and so I wanted to just go through the books that I currently own and essentially mark down ones that I want to reread soon with the intention of using that reread to decide whether they stay or whether they go. So it kind of works as a bookshelf tour, it kind of works as a little bit of a, I guess a haul in a way, to say here's some books that I will probably be reading soon. I'm currently in front of my main shelves, the ones that I film in front of typically, although I do also have another set of bookshelves on the opposite corner of my bedroom. If I can get them in frame, if I can sort that out, I will also be doing that shelf in this video. So we'll start with the topmost shelf that you really can't see that well. Very simply, on that shelf we have the pseudonymous Bosch books. I reread those last year as a form of childhood nostalgia, really enjoyed them, decided I definitely want to keep them for a reread in the future, and then next to them we have all my Harry Potters. We know how I feel about JK Turf Rowling, we know how I feel about Harry Potter though as a series, I really really like the books, Will I ever reread them? I have no idea, genuinely. However, I do know that I want to keep them. Ah, uh, I can't let go of them. The, the flaws of activism. I have feelings as much as I would like to be able to be ruthless and go, no, I do not support this author so I cannot own these books. I can't do it, so I'm just gonna keep them. Then we come to the next shelf along, the one that you kind of see some of the bottom most books on in my typical filming setup. Mostly this shelf is series because I figured having a dedicated shelf for series meant they were less likely to just clutter up the rest of my shelves, but in the corner here we have some standalone books. All About Mia was the second book of Lisa Williamson who wrote The Art of Being Normal, which is one of my favourite books of all time. I think it's just just a brilliant story so when I heard about her second book All About Mia I bought it as a hardcover. I believe this is signed as well. Yeah look at that! We got a book signature and everything. Nice! I definitely want to reread this one. I held back on rereading it because I found it very very triggering as someone with emetophobia, fear of vomiting, because there is a lot of vomiting that goes on in this book. The main character is a bit of a wild child, she's the middle child of three siblings and is the underachiever as far as her family is concerned, so she kind of overcompensates by being a real party girl. Um, I think that's the main reason I've actually held off on rereading this, but I remember it dealt with some really really interesting themes and I definitely want to give it another go. Ooh. Anything that isn't, anything that isn't this, I bought this one, well I didn't buy it, I was given it as a Christmas present because I had read it in my school library <laughs> back when I went to school and really really enjoyed it and now I don't know why because I remember this is a dystopian book and I am not a big fan of dystopias, however I did like this. However, do I still have the same reading taste as like 15 year old me? Who knows? Um, I would like to give this another go though because I have not read this copy, like this is an unread copy of the book and I feel like I should at least give it one chance to fulfil its role before I go, nah. See this is why I need space on this shelf. I now own Heartstopper Volume 4 and it needs to sit up with the others but there's no space currently. This is fun, I'm enjoying this. Gonna scoot round here. As far as other series go, we've got the Scythe series. Oh, this is a weird angle. See, I'm a bit tilted because my filming setup's a bit tilted. Let's hope this isn't super off-putting. So then, in terms of series, we've got the Scythe series, which I read last year for the first time and I absolutely adored it. Next to that, we have the Thirteen series, which I did a video on recently. Again, really, really enjoy it. Then next to that, oh, what's this? Oh yeah, this is a gift that I got given by my granny, which is a very very beautiful edition of Tales from Shakespeare, which is essentially 
little mini prose versions of all of Shakespeare's plays to make them a bit more accessible but it's got these beautiful swirly painted edges and it's got leather corners and a leather spine it's also just a really old copy what does it say? 1891 that just sits in there because as you can see my shelves have these lovely brackets on them to hold them up but it means that you have to put short books there otherwise it smashes the edges of the pages and destroys them so I have rogue books that sit on those little bracket sections so that I don't fuck up my nice copies of things now we come to an interesting series of books these are the Garvey Smith Mysteries by Simon Mason I picked up Running Girl probably two years ago now, I think I read it in 2019, and thought it was spectacular. I thought it was a really, really well done, really, really interesting murder mystery. However, I absolutely despise the protagonist of these books. Garvey Smith, the child genius that he is, is a supreme dickhead, and I absolutely despise him, and yet I still enjoy these books. I think Running Girl is the best of the three that currently exist. Now this is making me want to see if there's a fourth one out. God damn it, I told myself I wasn't going to buy any new books. I don't know why I like these books given I hate Garvey so much, but I do. Hence I have all three of them. I definitely want to do a reread of these at some point, at the very least because I want to talk about my feelings about the books in a bit more depth. And it's been a while since I've read them, but definitely keeping these. Now we're on to second shelf. This is going to be harder for me to twist around and talk about things, but we'll go from the end again. That's a photo album. We don't, we're not going to talk about that. Actually, you know what? Yeah, these are baby, baby photos of me, I should say. This is me when I'm like maybe a year old. You can't see that at all because of the camera. There we go, that's a very, very baby me playing in a soft play area. There you go, that's the only one you're getting to see. We've got some non-fiction books here. Then I've got CDs, I've got some little poetry pamphlet things, including... This is the booklet from when I was invited to Foils, because I was a runner-up. See, this is now just me going through things on my shelves that I wouldn't otherwise be looking at. I liked Foils, Foils was so fun. Ooh! Jack of Hearts and Other Parts. I read this because Hannah Witten recommended it. She's mostly a sex educator, but she also does sort of booktubey videos. And in a wonderful crossover, she talked about this book on her podcast. And it's very smutty. Well, it's not actually very smutty. It's a lot of fade to black smut, but very heavy on the innuendo and discussions of sex. Ironically I found this book genuinely quite scary because there is a stalker plotline in this. I like murder mysteries, in fact I really enjoy good murder mysteries, however they don't creep me out a huge amount, you know, they're tense sometimes, they're thrilling, but they don't scare me. However, the main character, Jack, in this gets stalked by someone he doesn't know, and so a lot of the plot is him trying to work out who it is who's sending him these, like, threatening messages, and that genuinely freaked me out a lot. So, you know, this book is interesting. I should definitely reread it soon, because I've only read it once. The Boy Who Steals Houses, I mainly bought because it has an incredible cover. Like, look at those shiny keys on that navy background. And then it has a lovely yellow back and a yellow spine as well. I thought it was beautiful. I was interested enough in the blurb to justify getting a book mostly based on the, the cover. And I did enjoy it. However, it is a long book. And I don't think it justifies the number of pages that it takes up. I don't know. I think this would be another good one to reread because I'm slightly on the fence about it, so I can truly go, do I keep it? Do I get rid of it? Yeah, my lovely little collection of Sarah Moore Fitzgerald books. Okay, on honest truth. Apple Tart of Hope is one of my favourite books of all time. I don't want to say it is my favourite book of all time, because I'm very predictable and can't actually choose a favourite book. However, it's phenomenal. I cannot recommend it enough. I then read her second book, A Very- no, this is her third, A Very Good Chance, which I enjoyed, like it was good. Then I read The List of Real Things, which again, was good, perfectly enjoyed. 
That was last year, then this year I read A Strange Kind of Brave, which is her most recent book, and I didn't like it. And it genuinely hurt my feelings that I did not like it because I normally absolutely adore Sarah Moore Fitzgerald's books, but I just didn't like it. And part of me thinks that it's just because it's for kids and that I'm just too fucking old now to enjoy kids books. Because there was nothing wrong with it. I had a few like nitpicky genuine flaws with it, but for the most part it was just like, I'm just not interested and Mm, it hurts my feelings. I might have to acknowledge that I'm just too old now for like middle grade children's fiction which makes me sad because I do like reading it still sometimes. But I, you know, this might be worth a second read in future just to double check I don't like it but these two, The List of Real Things and A Very Good Chance, I definitely want to do a reread of because I've only read them once each haven't read them since and they've been taking up space on my shelves mostly because all of her books have very very nice spines as well as covers got to be less sentimental Ugh. I stopped somewhere okay I read this on holiday when I was 16 I think I think it was the year I did my GCSE so that would make me 16 this is absolutely devastating. This book comes with a huge huge trigger warning. It is about a girl who is raped and then murdered by two boys and she gets stuck in the place that she was murdered as a ghost and continues to watch the comings and goings in her village and continues to see the people who raped and murdered her do the same to many other girls. They don't murder the others because her death was an accident but she watches them continue to abuse the women of her town from this liminal space and so she talks about her relationship with the boys up until that point, she talks about the aftermath, she talks about their trial because the boys get convicted for her murder and it is absolutely heartbreaking and devastating and it made me angry and uh, it gave me so many very very intense feelings and for that reason I thought it was an excellent book. I have not touched it since though because it is it's horrible, it's about horrible horrible subjects and it's incredibly difficult to read but I want to reread it because I want to see what my thoughts are now especially because I've read other books that deal with the topic similarly and also just because it, uh, it, it has a lot of feelings in it. This definitely goes on my reread list also because I may get rid of it just because Ouch! It's hard reading difficult books. Another place, I read this on the same holiday that I read I Stop Somewhere um, and I had very weird feelings about it. It was one of those books where I was like I don't know if I love this or hate this and so I definitely want to reread it, not least because it deals with mental health, specifically someone who's just come home from a psychiatric ward and I have no recollection really of anything other than that and I remember that only because it's also on the blurb. I loved the cover, I thought the cover was excellent. When I went on Storygraph the other day just to look at some books, I saw that this has really really low ratings and a lot of people are saying this is bad, this is not a good book and I didn't remember it being a bad book, it was just whether or not I liked it or not. I would be really really interested to reread this and see if my feelings have changed at all. Sire versus the Homo sapiens gender. Remember when this book was like the big book? Like everyone was talking about it. I definitely want to reread this because I read it once and I liked it, I thought it was fun, but I, I'm really interested to see if it has aged at all badly because of course activism nowadays moves on so so quickly and there are words that you could say I don't know five years ago that you absolutely cannot say now and although this was seen as incredibly progressive and liberating at the time I wonder if it still holds up in that way to modern readers because there's so much queer fiction nowadays and this was the only one at the time so I'd be really interested to reread this one. I might get rid of this one. I think I might accept that that this is the only Karen M. McManus book I like. I, I don't even think this is worth a reread, I think I'm gonna add that straight to my get rid of pile. That is this set of shelves done because down here 
is activity books in the corner as you can always see my big stack of brand new red stuff that doesn't have a proper official spot on my shelves and some non-fiction in the corner down there but yeah so this is shelf one done now to try and move my camera and see if i can do the shelves over there see you in a few seconds <laughs> I did it. I got myself to the other side of the room without knocking anything over and I was able to create an angle where you can actually see the top shelves of my bookshelf. I am currently stood on my bed because this bookshelf is literally floor to ceiling. I feel like I should also address the elephant in the room. Yes, we have Mr. Newt Scamander joining us from two angles as well as Queenie and Jacob Kowalski. I liked Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them when it came out. The second film sucked. Again, I have my my qualms about my allegiance to J.K. Rowling and her franchise. However, I like Eddie Redmayne. He's got a good face. Look at this man. Back to the books. Very, very top shelf. We have a few non-fiction things, but I will not be getting rid of any of them. Then we have this shelf. In a tag video I did a little while back, I talked about how I organise my books. I organise them based on vibes and themes and colours. Hence why over here is a whole load of really really dark books. Literally dark as well as having dark spines and over here is some kind of fluffy queer stuff which then gradually turns into darker stuff. But in the middle we have some dark queer stuff. We have a book missing from just in there because I took If We Were Villains off the shelf because I want to reread it again soon. I'm doing a reread of it anyway with no intention of getting rid of it because I love it. Psychology of Time Travel is an interesting book in a variety of ways. However, it confuses my brain so much. It's a really, really interesting, weird story, literally talking about the psychology of time travel through a series of really interesting plots, including a locked room murder mystery that clearly involves time travel in some way, discussions about the four women who created time travel in this sort of alternate universe, because I think it gets invented in the 1950s in this book, which is really interesting. And it talks a lot about the implications of time travel on mental health and sexuality, which is just fascinating. However, my brain is too small to understand time travel stuff. I'm just not very science minded and I do my best. However, that was a little bit too much for me, but I would definitely like to reread at some point, not least because it was a gift and I would love to get another reading out of it. Spellbook of the Lost and Found. Interesting again. I recently read, I say recently, the end of last year. <laughs> I keep forgetting we're already halfway through 2021. At the end of 2020, I read another Moira Fowley Doyle book and I found it awful. I thought it was terrible and I also thought it was just a rubbish iteration of her previous book. I remember liking Spellbook of the Lost and Found, I just really struggled with it because all the characters have plant names and it makes it very, very difficult to remember who's who, not least because there is a lot of sort of secret family members and relationship ties between a lot of them. It's one of those books where I'm like, I like this, but do I like it enough to hang on to? Same with Truth About Keeping Secrets. I enjoyed it at the time, haven't really thought about it since though. So I really want to reread Pulp. Pulp is a dual narrative story about a woman in the 1950s realising she is a lesbian and attempting to have a relationship with another woman despite the stigma and struggles at the time and she finds a lot of solace in pulp fiction which is one of the only ways that people can discuss these taboo relationships and it also follows then in the present day a queer girl who has just broken up with her girlfriend who is studying pulp fiction as part of her school research and ends up stumbling across a similar story to the vintage lesbians. I thought it was great, I really really enjoyed it at the time, I just haven't given it a huge amount of thought since, definitely worth a reread. Equally, I think I would probably hang on to it anyway, even if I don't reread it anytime soon because it's wholesome and I loved it. So then, on this shelf, we have a bunch of old favourites. We have my three Eva Ibbotson books. I loved Eva Ibbotson when I was like 
11, 12 years old. I feel like everyone did. I just haven't read it in a really, really long time because I've had other things that appeal to me more. I'm sure they still hold up. I'm sure I will still enjoy them equally. It has been a while. They definitely need to earn their spot on my shelves again. Art of Being Normal. Like I mentioned earlier, this is one of my favourite books and I believe it was this book that actually introduced me to the concept of being transgender. I want to see if the language in this holds up, similar to Simon versus the Homo Sapiens agenda. This was groundbreaking to me at the time and for a lot of people I'm pretty sure. However, I don't know if it still holds up. I think it has some very binary ideas about being trans. I certainly know it doesn't talk about being non-binary. It'll be interesting. Also, <laughs> look at the colour there versus the colour there. The sun damage that my books get here because there is a window just in front of where the camera is. The lie tree. I definitely need to reread The Lie Tree. The Lie Tree is a Frances Hardinge book. I love Frances Hardinge. This is excellent. It's just been a while since I read it. Definitely worth a reread equally. I am certain I will end up keeping it. Goodbye Perfect. This, oh, that shine. Beautiful. Destroying the lens. <laughs> this is another Sarah Bernard book, just like Beautiful Broken Things and Fierce Fragile Hearts. And again, it deals with some very, very interesting stuff. This is about a girl whose best friend runs away from home just before they're meant to start their GCSEs and she runs away with her mystery boyfriend. She's been very very secretive about this guy she's been seeing and what's the title's name? Eden. Eden is unsure about this guy that her friend is seeing and then when her friend goes missing she finds out who it is. I will spoiler if you won't want to know who it is this gets revealed very very early on but it doesn't say on the blurb so i wouldn't want to actually spoil the boyfriend is her music teacher yeah it's dodgy it is messed up it asks a lot of questions about young women's agency female friendship i remember thinking it was really well done equally dark i would love to reread this heidi Everyone knows Heidi. I'd love to reread it. It's been ages since I read it. Ooh! Silence is Goldfish by Annabelle Pitcher. Firstly, the little fishies on the spine are adorable. Secondly, this was really, really interesting to me when I first read it, and I think it was one of my first experiences with, like, proper girls YA literature, and I found it really, really interesting to experience that. Equally, <laughs> you see me bouncing on my bed trying to get my balance properly. <laughs> Equally, it's been ages since I read it and I'd be really, really interested to see how I feel about it reading it now. This definitely goes on the check out again pile. Red Clocks would be good to read again. This was another present from Evie who got me The Psychology of Time Travel. She lent me the book. I read it, loved it, and so got my own copy for Christmas. Really, really interesting feminist study of what it means to be a woman, talking about women's reproductive rights. It's like beautifully but gorily written. There's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of vagina imagery, which is really well done, equally makes for some quite strange reading at times, but like in a good way. Silence of the Girls, amazing, a retelling of the story of the Trojan War which if you've read the Song of Achilles, you'll know about that. From the perspective of Briseis, who is the kidnapped wife of Achilles, and it is horrifying, but brilliant. Then we have Cinderella is Dead, The Poet X, Long Way Down, all really, really good books by black authors, would recommend. Now, time to scoot down to some lower shelves. See you in a second. Right, here we go. Two new shelves of books. I will remove the watering can that is now only for decorative purposes because I killed the bonsai that it used to be used for. Here's some of my more kidlit stuff that I have still hung on to. Perks being a wallflower. I own mostly for functional reasons just because I feel like I can't get rid of it. I don't know how I feel about the book necessarily. It's one of those books that gives me like a not necessarily nice melancholic feeling in my chest. However, it feels like a sin to get rid of it. 
These are my Emma Carroll books. I really, really liked Emma Carroll when I was aged sort of 13, 14, 15. She writes quite nice historical vintage -y feeling girl stories. <laughs> And I really, really enjoyed them. The Girl Who Walked On Air was my favourite. I think this is the one I got signed. Yeah, I met her at a book signing and... Yeah. This was my favourite. This is the one I most want to reread because I absolutely adored it. Then we have Strange Star, which was her sort of retelling, reworking of the trip to Lake Geneva that Mary Shelley, Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, John Polidori all took in which the story of Frankenstein was created as well as the concept of Dracula among other things. I remember really liking this. I think I read this when I went on holiday to Norway which also definitely helped the vibes. Norway and Geneva aren't in the same place but it's got that same European vibe. I say that like England isn't European. Don't listen to me. <laughs> Don't get your geography lessons from people who talk about books on YouTube. <laughs> This is a ghosty story. I don't really remember a huge amount about this one. I think I would be happy just to get rid of this one as it stands. However, if I do decide to do a little like, you know, I could do Eva Ibbotson, Emma Carroll, Sarah Moore Fitzgerald. That is a good video idea, actually. I could just do like a couple of my favourite authors from Let Me Know. Would you be interested in that or should I just make it anyway? <laughs> This Lie Will Kill You is an interesting one because if you remember in my last video I talked about Lies Like Poison which was Chelsea Pitcher's most recent book which I bought because I had liked this one which I really didn't like <laughs> and so now I'm doubting my feelings about this one as well. I remember being hella confused by this when I was reading it. I, I think it's worth a reread just just to know with absolute certainty but equally eh. and then Mallory Towers in the corner I'm never getting rid of Mallory Towers it is like my childhood favorite series as in actual child childhood I would love to reread it soon not least because they're really really easy books but it will not be to determine whether or not I get rid of them this is a fairly empty shelf down here this is my Ruby Redford series again never getting rid of Ruby Redford I adore her the Little World Book Day one they did, which is an actual survival guide called Hang In There Bozo. Magical Mail. I got this book when I was seven because Claire Barker, the author, came into my primary school because she lives local to where I am to talk about this book and to talk about illustrating and about what it's like to be a writer and an artist. And I was so inspired as a little seven-year-old who had dreams of becoming an author. I picked this up at the marketplace because she was visiting there and she signed it, including saying, nice to see you again. And she was so very encouraging of my childhood desire to write. I will keep this book forever, probably just because I have those really, really fond memories of having someone say, you can absolutely write. I believe in you. Wholesome. And next to that is Highly Illogical Behaviour, which is a book about an agoraphobic kid. I told you I just shelve things. There was no rhyme or reason. I have no idea why this is next to Magical Mail by Claire Barker. This I did a reread of semi-recently to check whether I still wanted to keep it, and I thought, yes, I would like to keep it. So I'll be hanging on to this for a little while longer. Equally, it is still in that tenuous position of like, you're a solid three star, I liked what you had to say, do I care enough to keep you on my shelf forever? That remains to be seen. And the shelf below that is poetry, which I'm not going to go through in this video because I only buy poetry books that I want to have on my shelf, so that is it. There we go. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was fun. I had a really, really good time just going through my shelves and actually thinking about all the books I own and going, are these all books that I genuinely want to have around me? Like, am I going to be reaching for them? Because some of these books, as you saw, I have no qualms about going, yes, you are staying with me forever. I'm never getting rid of you. Whereas others, I'm there looking at them going, hmm, I don't remember my feelings about you. I think I like you, but I'm not entirely sure. Especially because a lot of the books on my shelves are things that I have just kept instinctively from when I first read them aged, 
like 13 to 17 so it's a real mix of books that I'm like I am absolutely certain books where I'm like I'm pretty sure and books where I'm like I have no idea if you still meet my expectations now. This has been good, it's helped me get some priorities in order. I'm going to actually make a little reading list on Storygraph so that I can mark down all these books and so that I can then filter my books on there and get my list up right away so that I can do some rereading soon because yeah, <laughs> cut back to the big stack of books that still needs to be shelved. Yeah, I need to make some space for those. So thank you very much for watching, I hope this was interesting. If you saw any books that you would particularly like me to reread or to talk about, please comment them down below. Yeah, if there's something you want me to discuss, let me know, I will make it a priority. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed, please like this video if you did enjoy it, feel free to subscribe for more bookish content, and I will see you next time. I need my sticker so that I can see my camera properly. This is state-of-the-art equipment here for making sure that I'm making eye contact with you. There we go. Oh, now I've fucked the fucking brightness settings. Shut up, Kate. Talk about the bloody books. Whoa. Crunchy spine. What time are we on? Oh, we need to speed up. I need to not speak while I'm ruffling my hair because I always cut it out. Hair ruffle complete. <laughs> And then this shelf is a fairly unf unfull. Shut up, Kate.